control. Clear for taxi and lineup. Runway 090. 263. Roger. Starting now. It is considered that any attempt to fly heavier than air machines at speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour, even if the means were available, would be found to be physically impossible. Mathematicians have now proved conclusively that 500 miles per hour is the absolute limit in airplane speeds. And anyone talking of flying at anything like the speed of sound is guilty of irresponsible prognostication. The pundits prattle and mathematicians grumbling gently curl up their digits and pass on. The world shrinks. Man and machine are alone. And we stand in head-bowed, humble attitude at his audacity. 263, ready for takeoff. Pressurization on. Oxygen on and functioning. Instrumentation on. Start recorder. Controls OK. Fuel check. 065. I'm raising the suit. Camera turning. I'm opening her up now. Study this man as he nudges gently into another world. The open, lonely sky is his playground, where the rules are strict and the stakes are higher than those with which you or I would like to play. The powered controls are to be tested for full maneuverability at speeds of Mach 18, 19 and 2. No headlines, no pressmen pressing on to the limits of their imagination. Perhaps a nodding of scientific heads and a murmuring to try again tomorrow. There is a pattern to research that finds itself repeated in the pages of our history. Turn back a handful of time, a page or two will do. It was only yesterday in the span of our inheritance. In 1927, the Air Ministry formed the RAF high-speed flight. At speeds of 300 miles per hour, pilots in the Schneider Trophy contests were experiencing new phenomena. For the first time, blacking out and aileron flutter were mentioned. A new era of flight research had suddenly been created. We want more power. We must cut down the drag. We want thinner weight. Strengthen the fuselage. Streamline the cockpit. Balance the controls. Cool the engine. Cool the water the oil. We want more speed. In 1931, Group Captain Stainforth flew at 407 miles per hour. We were learning fast. Turn the pages on again, and a paragraph of war slips past. But not before it gives the all-demanding cry for speed and speed, and yet more speed. <laughs> gave them the power, and with it, the key of the door to a new world. 606 miles per hour. 615. 623. 650. 698. With small, deliberate advances, they approach the speed of sound. No room is left for trial and error now. The science of high-speed flight is slide ruled with precision. 715, 735, 752, and then... Hold on to your seats, gentlemen. We're going supersonic. 
1,132. As you have seen, we have learned a little. Let no man think the problems are behind us. There is no end to research in the air. Down there, mankind is striving to take another step on the path of high-speed flight. Inventing and developing. Probing and challenging. Calculating, scrutinizing. And fishing in the uncharted backwaters of green sea bewilderment. Brave men died, and the world gained by their sacrifice. <laughs> We have advanced a step on the obscure path that will be an open road for the children of tomorrow. Let the voice of the designer speak. Here is a possible shape for high-speed flight. A long, thin fuselage, we better give it a tail, and short, straight, thin wings. Now for the tail plane, either a high one, or maybe what we call a canard like this. We need an engine, so let's put that in the fuselage. I've got another drawing here that might help. This is the engine. I'll have to make the long, thin fuselage a bit fatter, but that's no great worry. We can give it a nose air intake with a straight-through jet. Now for the short, thin wings, and they give us a fuel storage headache right away. Even with integral tanks, these wings won't hold nearly enough fuel. We might try thickening the wings a bit to give us extra space. There we are. Well, that's quite fair, but we've also put up weight and the drag. There's not much choice. It means we're going to need more power to achieve the same speed as before. Let's put in another engine. There we are, one above the other. That means an even bigger fuselage. However, the increased thrust of the two engines will look after that. We need bigger air intakes, so we'll put those in the wing roots. Yeah. Now we can put the driver and the instrumentation up in the nose. Well, here is a good idea with one fundamental snag. More power means more fuel, and we still haven't got a place to store it. Let's put the fuel in the fuselage and try the engines out on the wings. Well, this in turn means lengthening the short wings, which puts up the weight. The two engine nacelles will put up the drag, and we're back to where we came in. Let's start again and take a swept back wing design. Here are the air intakes in the wing roots. We'll give it about 50 degrees of sweep. These are pretty useful at transonic speeds, but they don't give much lift when landing and taking off. And we still haven't got adequate fuel storage. We can add fillets at the trailing edge to help both these problems, maybe bigger ones. But up goes the weight again. Let's make it a delta and have much more storage space and lift. Here we are, a good dart-shaped flying wing. Now we can store the fuel in integral tanks at various points. We can give the driver a complete pressure egg up the sharp end, and we're left with only one serious snag. Our beautiful high-speed aircraft is too heavy to even leave the ground. So we start again. It's all very frustrating. It is not to be wondered that we see so many diverse configurations above our unsuspecting heads.
behind this apparent diversion of opinion, it's a story of compromise in order to meet a specification. Specification number 40372 will be guarded into supersonic flight. Mach 3, or more than three times the speed of sound. It must be powered by both rockets and jet engines. It must have an endurance of not less than 20 minutes at a height of 70,000 feet. It must have full flight recording instrumentation. It must carry a pilot, and it must not exceed an all-up weight of 10,000 pounds. The requirements are known. The answer will come from the coffers of the world's experience. Witness now the birth pangs of an aircraft. That strange alchemy that turns paper calculations into surging life up high. Do not for one moment think that it is easy. It may take a full year to complete the design of a new high-speed aircraft and another seven years before it will fly. The component parts have to be calculated and drawn right down to the smallest detail. New forms of construction found, new metals tested and proved, stresses and strains reduced to factual measurements. There's no room for error. These problems are common to all who endeavor to achieve prolonged supersonic flight. Even with the aid of the most modern electronic computers, this wealth of detail takes months and months of painstaking labor to reach even the semblance of a future aircraft. The electronic brains spew out their answers. A project is emerging into life. But first, a model must be made to prove the findings of a host of facts and figures. In order to study the low speed characteristics of an aircraft, wooden models are made. These must be contoured with great accuracy sometimes wired for pressure gauge testing, and finally polished to a very high degree. Low-speed wind tunnels are in considerable demand because high-speed aircraft must be controllable at relatively low speeds for landing. The models are suspended in the working section, and sometimes tufts of wool are glued to the wing surfaces so that the airflow may be studied. rapid advance of speeds beyond the transonic range, a host of new problems demanded urgent answers. In America and Europe, high-speed wind tunnels were built. In England, this mammoth structure is nearing completion. It's probably the most versatile supersonic wind tunnel in the world. Giant turbines can be swung into line to give some 80,000 horsepower at a speed of Mach 4. Models for use in these supersonic tunnels can no longer be made of wood. Milled from a solid bar of stainless steel, the miniatures of tomorrow's aircraft have to be contoured to an accuracy of one thousandth of an A new industry of precision craftsmanship has grown up in the land. The smaller models call for an even greater degree of accuracy. Many weeks of the most delicate milling go into each operation, with constant checking on the all-important contour of the wings. One cut too many can undo a month's patient work. The wings are grooved to accept the electronic nerves that will respond to air pressure on the metal when exposed to the hot tornado of the supersonic tunnel. With the need for more specific data, we may expect an even greater accuracy of finish by new forms of high precision casting. When the model has passed its final inspection, it's ready for the first of many tests. speed tunnels, the problems of observation and analysis are made more acute by the enormous pressure of air that is being blasted against the slender model. Television cameras are used to observe phenomena that no human eye could see. 
and the hand of the electronic engineer is evident in every scientific step. In many parts of many lands, this story is repeated. Listen. certain tests at extremely high speeds, the model is attached to the nose of a rocket. The model is packed with telemetering equipment that will relay back a mass of detailed information during this one and only flight into the future. Metallurgists are now faced with a new complication, for kinetic heat is producing temperatures at which normal forms of aluminium melt away. Using infrared lamps to simulate what the Americans have dubbed the thermal thicket, scientists are investigating new metals such as titanium and new alloys in stainless steel to combat this barrier to sustained supersonic speed. This ultra-thin wing suspended in its test rig is being heated to some 300 degrees centigrade in order to study metal fatigue and other possible causes of structural failure. New forms of construction are constantly being devised and tested. For strength and lightness, a honeycomb construction capable of holding ducted air to overcome heat problems is prepared for testing. Similar in principle is metal corrugation, sandwiched between the outer and inner layers of skin the outer skin being held accurately in jigs to maintain the vital contour. This in turn has led to improved methods of spot welding that supersedes the use of rivets, so providing the smooth finish necessary to high-speed flight and a strength that is even greater than that of the rivet. The smallest maneuver at supersonic speeds imposes a tremendous centrifugal force on the aircraft. Every moving part has to be designed and tested to work and keep working under such a tremendous force of gravity. There can be no room for error in a flight in which the malfunction of the smallest valve on the pilot's mask can be as disastrous as the failure of the engine or the complete disintegration of the aircraft itself. Smaller, lighter and yet more powerful powered controls are being designed to give the pilot full maneuverability, free from wingtip flutter and the many other problems inherent in supersonic flight. Not only does each component part have to be tested to breaking point, but large sections of the aircraft fuselage and wings are suspended in giant rigs, so that the repeated stresses and strains of flight conditions can be carefully analyzed. By constant vibration, an advanced stage of metal fatigue can be induced, and this, coupled with the problems of kinetic heat, is leading our aerodynamicists to study new methods of construction. 
Even though the scientists can produce in 10 days simulated flight, the effects of some 10 years actual flying, the research work is often arduous and slow. Success or failure in one field is no criterion of the answer in another. We stand on the threshold of a new era and turn to the youth of our time for their skill. They hold the key to tomorrow's achievement. The secrets are being slide ruled into reality. New vistas of high-speed flight are opened as each new concept is carefully tried and tested. The cost is high. New plants and equipment have to be installed. New research methods which are involved and complex must be brought into use. There are no shortcuts. Hundreds of thousands of pounds may be spent on a single project that may never see the light of day. It is the price of knowledge and experience. This aircraft will never fly. She was built to be destroyed. While her sisters may be breaking records up above, these wings will be flexed to breaking point down below. The cost is great, but then so is the knowledge gained. We have witnessed a little of your problems, discerned a little of your workaday world. The shadow of the craftsman is always by your side. You ride a thirsty charger when you fly today's machines. The fuel is being driven through its veins at more than 30 gallons every minute. At the Petroleum Research Station at Sunbury on Thames, physicists, chemists and petroleum engineers are dealing with critical problems such as the stability of fuels, even when used as a coolant to absorb a major part of the heat generated in high-speed flight. Other research is directed to improving filtration techniques to ensuring that, from the first moment of ignition, fuel can be pumped to the engine even under arctic temperatures. To the development of a wide range of special fuels and lubricants to meet the needs of new and even more powerful engines now being developed. Here is power in the testing. Here are turbine blades balanced to a watchmaker's accuracy. Metals that must withstand the most grueling of temperatures. Hot gases will scream through its tortured intestines and the world will vibrate with the sound of its energy. The compressor swallows the hot breath of our age and mankind waits patiently for the metal to grow tired. In the vibration section, every movement is recorded for the eventual analysis of metal fatigue. The compressor runs at a speed and temperature far higher than anything expected in its normal life. Listen to the heartbeat on the stethoscope of science. Click clacks, needle flicks. Dial throbbing, light twitching, hum drumming, seesawing, plastic faced, wire gutted, pop goes the weasel. Water is used for certain airflow tests aimed at reducing drag and turbulence within the engine. The information gained, together with the study of ramming effect from shock waves inherent in high speed flight, is enabling the engineer to design new shapes of air intakes that can be changed in flight to suit the speed. The engine designers have given us power undreamt of a few years ago. They too are faced with new heat problems of growing complexity, resulting from the added thermal heat induced by supersonic flight. From a standing cold start, the turbine blades of a jet must withstand a rise in temperature of 800 degrees centigrade in only five seconds. At full power, the metal must withstand a stress of two tons per square inch at a temperature of over 1,000 degrees centigrade. At these temperatures and pressures, the blades of a turbine are liable to creep and distort. The problem of cooling these engines and of finding new and better metals with which to make them requires constant research and development if we are to take the next bold step with safety.
longer is one form of power plant sufficient for our needs. Rockets and ram jets are becoming commonplace additions to the once all-powerful turbojet in order to meet the demand for greater thrust and higher speed. In France, an air-launched ramjet-powered aircraft has already undergone extensive trials. In Great Britain, rocket-started ramjet test vehicles add daily to our store of knowledge. Soon we shall see the fruits of the many years' research. The tremendous increase in thrust brought about by the development of new engines has led aircraft designers to consider new methods of taking off and landing, thereby obviating the costly long runways so necessary to high-speed aircraft. At the same time, the severe weight penalty of shock-resisting undercarriages designed to withstand the fast landing speeds of today could be reduced. In the United States, where there are vast areas of desert that make natural landing grounds, the designers are able to explore high supersonic speeds with aircraft that are launched from a mother ship. The limited fuel supply can then be used entirely for the high-speed tests. In France, a trolley has been used to replace the orthodox undercarriage. This enables the aircraft to take off on comparatively rough surfaces and allows for very clean aerodynamic design. Many countries tried boosting the takeoff power by means of rockets and auxiliary jet engines. These methods reduce the takeoff run appreciably, but so far have made no contribution to the landing. In Great Britain, experiments were made to prove the possibility of vertical takeoff and landing by engine thrust alone. The success of these trials was such that we may sense with some accuracy the shape of things to come. However, for the moment, we are faced with the harsh realities of our English weather, our limited landing fields, and our strict economy. British aircraft must be designed to operate from existing runways in all weathers, with complete control and in complete safety. Opening up plus five zero for second run. Make a note to fix this oxygen mask. It's too tight. Mech one five. Acceleration ruddy quick at this speed. Reheat on. Opening up. Mech one eight. Getting a bit rough. The human factor is the weakest link. Airframes can be constructed to withstand far higher stresses than those with which the human body can compete. At supersonic speeds, the problem of cooling is vital to human efficiency. Royal Air Force medical officers work in this heated tunnel for hours, sometimes even for days on end, while other doctors study their mental alertness. After three hours of intense concentration, in an air temperature of over 200 degrees centigrade, this subject is barely able to follow the pointers on his panel. As speeds increase, the pilot must be able to read and react to cockpit instruments even faster than before. These flying doctors at the RAF Institute of Aviation Medicine are gradually overcoming this problem. Special suits have been developed to counteract the tremendous pull of gravity, and modern science is providing devices for measuring the slightest reaction of the human body. This human guinea pig is going to be subjected to a force of 5G, five times the pull of gravity a force that is not uncommon in high-speed flying today. The reaction of the human body to the effects of gravity is but one of the many problems which these flying doctors are investigating, and to which a safe and practical solution must be found.
safety in the air is the motto of these doctors, and they work closely with the manufacturers of pilot ejection seats. Relentless and courageous research has made this device safe to use even during the actual takeoff. you are alone up there in that silent midnight world of yours. And so you are, for the moment. Only a few, a chosen few, can join you in your experience. But it will not be long before we of all nations come to join you. The world will shrink and man will become neighbours with himself. Other lands will lie just beyond our garden fence, instead of far beyond our imagination. Your courage will be put to good account the learning, the discerning, the planning and the calculating will have reaped its reward. Our heritage is in your hands. Guard it well and hand it on to your son for his safekeeping. keeping.